Good morning. I'm House Republican Leader Jim Durkin of the 82nd District, Western Springs, and I'm joined today with Representative Patrick Windhorse of Metropolis, Illinois. This past January, I introduced House Bill 5126, a bill to fundamentally reform the Illinois Prisoner Review Board. My legislation ensures a more victim-focused, equitable, and balanced prisoner review board for Illinois. Unfortunately, Democrats in the House, Illinois House, have refused to call this bill for a hearing and vote. Now, the events of the last several weeks have clearly demonstrated that this legislation is still desperately needed in Illinois, and I hope the majority party will wake up and allow this bill to be called. We have seen the governor blame Republicans for his own prisoner review board failure and also illogical decisions. Recently, two members of the PRB prisoner review board have been rejected by the Democrat-controlled Senate, and an additional member has resigned before his vote in the Senate. And just a few weeks ago, Max Serta, a convicted double murderer, was pulled from the board after serving for nearly a year after being appointed by Governor Pritzker, a convicted double murderer. The governor needs to get on top of this situation and stop prioritizing hardened criminals and cop killers over victims and the citizens of Illinois. It's no surprise, it should, it should come as no surprise with this governor that crime is up across Illinois. Carjackings, armed robberies, and murders are all reaching new heights. That is what happens when the governor and his allies like Kim Fox push policies that create a consequence-free Illinois for criminals. Time and time again, my colleagues and I have stood before you to discuss, to discuss the repercussions of the defund police and anti-victim legislation signed into law by Governor Pritzker, Pritzker and his legislative cohorts. It has broken our criminal justice system and thrown it on top of its head. When perpetrators of violent crimes like cop killers are not held accountable, there is a horrific consequence to each and every one of the victims. Governor Pritzker, through his board appointments, has abandoned these victims and their families. Today I ask that the legislature remember the forgotten voices in our criminal justice system, the victims of crime. We must remember the nephew who grew up with stories of his brave police officer uncle, but without the man himself because he was murdered while serving a community he cared for deeply. The family of a 16-year-old boy who never got to see that child grow up because he was murdered while out fishing after school. We have to remember the women who survived multiple rapes and physical assaults only to have it come rushing back to her when the man who committed these heinous crimes was released from prison. It's these voices that must be front and center, and these voices must be given a far greater weight than the pleas of the convicted killers, serial rapists, and murderers. We cannot, we cannot discount the despair and anguish felt by victims of violent crime and the futility their families experience seeking closure for the brutal loss of a family member. That pain and torment continues with Governor Pritzker's overseeing, this pain and torment continues with Governor Pritzker overseeing this prisoner review board. Let me take some time to tell you about three notable cases that I, I find are particularly telling about what is happening at our PRB. Paul Bryant is a murderer, a cold-blooded murderer, with a long history of violent crimes, including numerous convictions for murder, rape, home invasion, burglary, and more. He was convicted of killing a 59-year-old woman whose throat was slashed during a robbery in 1976, and a 19-year-old girl who he raped, beat, strangled, and set on fire in 1977. Another woman was held at knife point, robbed and raped in her home by Paul Bryant. Ultimately, Bryant was caught after breaking into a women's home, robbing and raping her, and returning a few days later again to rape her again. The repeat victim was able to call police and also identify Bryant. The judge who sentenced Bryant to 500 to 1,500 years for just one of the murders in which he committed and he was convicted of, said at the time of, sentence, at, at the time of sentencing that he wanted to send a message to future parole boards that Bryant should never be released to the public. On July 14, 2020, J.B. Pritzker's Prisoner Review Board voted to release Paul Bryant back into the public. Today he lives just a block, a mere 400 feet away from a park in Chicago. Ray Larson, a man 
convicted of murdering a child and also convicted of deviant sexual behavior, made headlines last year when just days after being released, he absconded from the state of Illinois, violating the terms of his parole and becoming a fugitive. It was not the first time that Larson had proven himself a risk. In May of 1972, while on a three-day furlough from the Illinois Department of Correction, Larson entered the home of a woman with a gun and sexually assaulted her. Following the assault, the assault, he went to Schiller Woods, which is in the northwest side of Chicago, looking for someone to shoot when he came across 16-year-old Frank Casillary, who was fishing. Larson shot Casillary not one, but 23 times and left his naked body in the woods. Larson was caught the next day in a stolen vehicle with an underage girl who, he, who had been missing overnight. Ultimately, despite Larson have committing these crimes while on furlough, he was released by Governor Pritzker's pr Prisoner Review Board in May of 2021. This release was over the objection of Attorney General Kwame Raoul, whose office tried to delay that decision for 90 days so that he could evaluate Larson as a possible sexually violent person. person. Ultimately, after skipping town, the PRB had to rescind Larson's parole. Johnny Veal is a cop killer, an unabashed cop killer. In July of 1970, Chicago Police Sergeant James Severin and Chicago Police Officer Anthony Rosado had been assigned to the Cabrini Green, Cabrini Green Complex after volunteering, volunteering for the Walk and Talk Community Outreach Program, which aimed to reduce crime. On July 17th, Severin and Rosado were murdered in cold blood while crossing across a baseball field in the complex as part of a coordinated sniper attack planned and executed by a Chicago street gang. Johnny Veal was an integral part of the planning and carrying out of this attack on law enforcement and bragged about his involvement to rival gang members. Testifying before the Prisoner Review Board, Sergeant Severin's nephew said he could remember his uncle saying how much he loved working with the local kids at the Cabrini Green Project, particularly at the baseball field and then being brutally murdered on the same field the next week. Even, even Cook County State Attorney Kim Fox voiced opposition to Veal's parole, calling the officer's murders a cold-blooded execution, while also pointing out that Veal bragged about these crimes. Governor Pritzker's Prisoner Review Board voted to release Veal in February of 2021. These are just three specific cases, horrible cases, but they tell you everything you need to know about what the governor thinks about crimes and also victims. We cannot allow this to go unchecked. Violent career criminals be given their freedom back after they have taken so much from the victims and their families. Governor Pritzker and his administration have failed which is why I filed House Bill 5126 in January to fix the mess that the governor has allowed to happen. The PRB needs reform now, and this is how I propose to do it. Revise and codify the mission statement of the Prisoner Review Board. The Prisoner Re Review Board is to protect the rights of victims of crime, their families, and the citizens of Illinois by ensuring that the rule of law is upheld and that justice is carried out. The board has a responsibility to give voice, to give voice to the victims, their family members, and public safety officials when an inmate situation is being reviewed. Require five members of the board to have experience as a law enforcement officer or prosecutor. Increase transparency by making in bank hearings available for viewing through live stream. Make clemency re recommendations from the board to the governor available to the public with appropriate redactions to protect the victim's identity. Require a higher, a two-thirds vote threshold for parole of people convicted of first-degree murder. It outlines those who may present testimony at the parole hearing. One representative of the person under consideration for parole, one representative of law enforcement from the county of conviction, and one family member of each victim. The governor will now have the, under this bill, has, the, has to grant or deny the decisions of the PRB to release an inmate on parole or to revoke their parole or aftercare release in cases of first-degree murder. These decisions will be subject to FOIA. 
In regards to clemency hearings, the legislation required the board to give victims registered with the board written notice of the application for clemency within seven days of the filing of the application. If the victim does not file a witness statement after 30 days, the board shall seek a, written a second written notice to that victim. Now, in recent weeks, the need to reform the Prisoner Review Board and how it functions has only become more apparent. It is clear that Governor Pritzker cannot be trusted with the Prisoner Review Board as it is currently set in law, and the General Assembly must make those changes. We must have a Prisoner Review Board that puts victims and their families first, that is transparent in how its decisions are made, and that the PRB is accountable for those decisions. I'd like to hand the microphone over to Patrick Windhorst to talk about the Safety Act and the problems that are currently erupting under that. Thank you, Leader. Good morning, I'm Patrick Windhorst, State Representative of the 118th District. I'm a resident of Metropolis and uh, Massac County. Previously, before serving as State Representative, I was State's Attorney in Massac County from 2004 to 2018. I'm proud to be here today with Republican leader Jim Durkin, another former prosecutor. I serve as a member of the House Judiciary Criminal Committee. I was only one of two legislators allowed to ask questions about the massive criminal justice reform bill known as the Safety Act that passed the House over serious objections of law enforcement organizations. I'd like to review the state of criminal justice and public safety in the state of Illinois. From the mid-1990s when it was at its peak until the mid-2010s, the crime rate dramatically dropped in the state and in the nation. In fact, in Illinois, the violent crime rate dropped over 50%. Around the mid-2010s, continuing till now, criminal justice reform efforts have stripped away many of the laws designed to promote public safety. Most notable was the initial bail reform effort in 2010, which was effective in 2018, and the bail reform initiated in Cook County around that same time. Those efforts culminated in the passage of the Safety Act last January and its massive overhaul of the criminal justice system and policing in our state. Where do we stand now? In 2021, violence in Chicago reached a level not seen in 25 years as nearly 800 people were murdered. The 2022 murder rate is on pace with last year, meaning another tragically deadly year ahead. Violent crime is up 4% on the year, with a 31% increase in overall property crime already in 2022. This follows a four-year decline in property crime uh, rates dropping back to 2018 and after their historic reductions in violent crime, which I referenced earlier. This is all occurring while many of the most concerning provisions of the Safety Act haven't taken effect yet. I've taken to this microphone several times throughout this abbreviated session to highlight legislation that will repeal the Safety Act and to note the consequences we are seeing now that were predicted before the Safety Act was even passed. The elimination of cash bail, which we will see in January of next year, a policy that has been disastrous in other states. Unlimited anonymous complaints against police officers, enhanced legal jeopardy for police officers, and reduce penalties for serious crimes. Fulfilling our duty to citizens to provide the safe and civil society they deserve demands our justice system draw hard lines against violent crime. A peaceful society can only be maintained when the pendulum of justice does not swing too far toward the perpetrators of chaos, violence, and organized crime in our communities and too far away from the rights afforded to victims. After the Safety Act was signed by Governor Pritzker, we have seen the job of law enforcement officers become more dangerous and harder to do, while criminals appear more emboldened, emboldened than ever. As trailer bill after trailer bill has been brought forth to correct technical mistakes in the original act, the point that Democrats rushed through a flawed product at a late hour of session that was filled with drafting errors, policy flaws, and unintended consequences has only been made clearer. And as we anticipate, even in this session, more criminal justice legislation, I am concerned we will see a product crafted by only one party, as we have seen over the last two years. Illinoisans deserve to live in safe communities and neighborhoods without the fear of violent criminals being back on the streets to reoffend and terrorize their communities. <clears throat> 